I mean, I found special girl. Your book has arrived early. Yeah, I don't think that works. <laughs> Am I we good? Hi, hello everybody here in the room and on Zoom. I understand that we had something like 700 people signed up on Zoom around the world. So good noon, good midnight, whatever time it is, wherever you are. <clears throat> so this is our panel on the Chinese Communist Party 20th Party Congress, a very important event. We're lucky at Columbia, we the university has invested in a very strong group of China specialists. What we have up here on the dais here or the table is just a small portion of all of the China specialists at the university. We have people in the law school, school of social work, the school of urban planning, the anthro department, the, uh, the uh, East Asian languages and literatures department. We have many experts who could be up here, but this is already a large number of people to comment on the significance of the 20th Party Congress. <clears throat> um, I'll just briefly introduce the panelists starting down at the end. Junyan Jiang is an assistant professor in the political science department. And then Shang Jin Wei is our N.T. Wang professor in the business school. And you're associated with the School of International and Public Affairs as well. And then Xiaobo Lu is the Ann Whitney Olin Professor of Political Science at Barnard College. Tom Christensen is the Shotwell Professor of International what? Relations. <laughs> Relations in SIPA and also the Director of the China and the World Program, which brings <clears throat> to campus every year a couple of very, very excellent postdocs who are teaching courses, and I see you guys there. And um, and then we have Sunja, who is the director of the China Initiative in SIPA, and I'm Andy Nathan in the political science department. So these people are very qualified to tell us something about the significance of the 20th Party Congress. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, commentary out there that has laid down a number of sort of conventional wisdoms. And I asked the panelists uh, to comment on these conventional wisdoms, either they support them or they want to modify or uh, contradict them. Uh, the, uh, and I don't have to do any work. I just pose this problem to them. But the conventional wisdom is that Xi Jinping has definitively consolidated his power. All opposition to him within the Chinese Communist Party has been vanquished. Uh, this is very, the second conventional wisdom is that that situation is very dangerous because nobody will dare to tell Xi Jinping the truth and he will therefore make serious policy mistakes in politics or in economics or in foreign policy. <clears throat> Third point is that his economic vision is one of state control which is going to slow down the economy on top of the slowdown that's happening because of his COVID zero policy, that as he uh, continues to try to control private enterprise where the growth dynamism is in the economy and emphasize the role of state-owned enterprises and state control even of private enterprises, the economy will further slow down, which will cause a lot of trouble. Another conventional wisdom is that the US and China, because of, in the West, we blame Xi Jinping for this, because of Xi Jinping's aggressive or assertive foreign policy that the rest of the world has woken up, that the United States in particular has woken up, and that China and the US are locked into what will be a very long new Cold War confrontation competition <clears throat> of some kind that carries a high risk of war, although neither side really wants to launch an armed conflict, but there's a high risk that such a thing will take place. Um, another conventional wisdom is that <clears throat> high tech areas are headed into complete decoupling that there will be two high-tech systems, the Western and the Chinese, 
and they we you know they will each develop on their own. Um, so I want to ask the panelists to comment on these ideas and other ideas that they may have about the meaning of what has just happened. One thing we know in China is that sooner or later something surprising will happen, but we don't know what it is. And we will see. That's what makes it surprising. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's surprising because we don't know what it's going to be. So I am going to be surprised by what my colleagues on the panel have to say. So we'll start with Jun Yen. I'm going to, uh, uh, we won't have that much time for questions, but I I'm going to monitor the Q&A button on Zoom so people who are out there in the world can submit your questions on the Q&A button on Zoom and people who are in the room will be able to raise your hand after the presentations and there's a mic here. So I'll call on a few people in the room and I'll pose some of the questions from the Q&A to the panelists after they make their short presentations. So we agreed we would start with politics. We'll start with Jun Yen and sure. Xiaobo and then we'll go to Econ. We'll ask Shang Jing, Shang Jin to give his remarks and then we'll go to foreign policy with, with Tom on general foreign policy implications and Sunja on US-China relations in particular. Thank you guys. So Junyan, over to you. Sure. Uh, well, thanks Andy uh, for uh, organizing this and uh, putting us together. Uh, initially, we tended this to be a relatively small event, but you know, look at where we are. Uh, well, that tells you how much of uh, uh, interest that people have in uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, in many ways, a historical sort of events. Right? Uh, so I work on uh, domestic politics. So you know, most of my comments will be about uh, domestic politics. Uh, and I, actually, I think on that, I'm, I, I don't disagree with the conventional wisdom that much. Uh, I think the conventional wisdom has uh, uh, sort of some uh, some insights on that. Uh, but I'll add a few things. Right? Uh, so to me, I think the most uh, uh, interesting and uh, sort of uh, uh, important thing uh, that emerges from the uh, the Twentieth Party's Congress is that. Uh, uh, at least at, least at the uh, sort of elite level, right, we're, we're observing a very interesting uh, transformation uh, in terms of the role of the, the Politburo Standing Committee, this uh, fundamental uh, governing uh, institution that uh, the party has. So, uh, uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so historically, if you think about the, you know, what the so Standing Committee uh, does, right, it usually has two roles. One is that uh, it is a, a sort of institution for power sharing. Right? Uh, so this is a venue uh, at which uh, you know, all the uh, interests, uh, uh, you know, factions, cliques, groups uh, within the party right, get representation right, and get uh, recognized and acknowledged right, by having a seat at this, uh, this uh, uh, what is basically a power center right, of the party. Uh, so that's one function of it. Uh, but at the same time, it is also uh, an institution uh, for governing. Uh, it's a decision. Uh, it's the highest decision-making uh, body of the party, right? where uh, some of the most consequential uh, policies uh, for this country uh, uh, were made. Right? Uh, so you know, historically, you know, when designing an institution and sort of uh, trying to figure out who to appoint to those institute to this institution, you know, there has to be a balance between these two uh, uh, priorities, right? But then, you know, coming out of the 20th Party Congress, I think, you know, one very clear trend is that uh, uh, there is uh, less and less uh, emphasis uh, on the first function, right, being a power sharing institution, uh, but the increase in emphasis on the second, right, as a governing institution to make policies and to uh, uh, sort of make decisions, right? Uh, so in a way, this is almost like a transformation from, transition from a, a, a sort of Leninist style uh, institutional power sharing to a presidential cabinet. If you will, right, where uh, aside from the president, every other, every uh, other member of the cabinet basically serves as the interest of the top leader, right? and uh, they can be appointed and disposed uh, uh, at the pleasure of uh, uh, the person who is actually uh, in charge. Right? Uh, so you see, you know, more and more of that. Right? I mean, one great example of that is if you look at the, the you know the second ranking member uh, of the standing committee, right? uh, who are usually the premier. Right? Uh, throughout the history of the PRC, you know, the second member, uh, usually, you know, someone with an independent power base, a different <coughs> line of uh, sort of, uh, uh, has a different line of followers, right? a very different uh, background than uh, the 
sort of actual party uh, leader, right? Uh, but this is uh, clearly no longer the case uh, in the uh, in the current lineup, right? Where uh, you know the second <coughs> highest member is basically uh, well before you know uh, he was elevated to the second one, he was uh, uh, not a particularly senior person. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, within the party, and also, you know, he is uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, very much on his uh, advancement right, to uh, uh, the blessing of, of Xi. Right? Uh, and not only him, right? if you look at uh, the, uh, there are three other <coughs> sort of newly promoted members in the standing committee, and uh, <coughs> they more or less follow a similar sort of uh, uh, path and, you know, uh, have prioritized or interactions with Xi and, uh, you know, got his blessing and uh, uh, then entered uh, the standing committee, right? Uh, so in many ways, this is a sort of a presidential cabinet really uh, in making. Right? It's no longer a sort of a institutional collective rule. Uh, so in that, I think I agree with uh, the conventional wisdom. Right? Uh, but then, you know, uh, another uh, important question that naturally follows is, uh, you know, what does this bode uh, for uh, China's future? Right? You know, the economy, uh, the reform, or you know, uh, everything else. Right? So in the economy, I think I'll, I'll defer to uh, you know Shang Jing and uh, some of my other colleagues uh, to comment on that. But I will say one thing. Right. And this is where I, I think I disagree with the, the conventional wisdom a little bit. So the conventional wisdom, as Andy just mentioned, is that, that you know concentration of power is really bad, and uh, you know uh, once you have centralization, and you know uh, the, the the top leader going to start uh, making mistakes, and uh, you know you're not going to listen, and uh, uh, you know uh, you have bad policies. Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. I think there are certainly uh, sort of merits and uh, uh, an element of truth in that, right? But the Another way of thinking about this is, um, you know, in a cabinet uh, style of government, I mean, there's one thing that is really uh, valuable, uh, which is ensure supply uh, in a power sharing institution, and that is a trust, right? So once you have a cabinet, when the president or the party chief gets to a point, right, whoever he likes, right, I mean, there is actually a, a, a greater level of trust among this, uh, within this administration. Right? Uh, as a top leader, you know, he's probably more uh, willing to uh, delegate some of the tasks, right, to underlings when they know that, when he knows that, you know, the underlings were appointed by him and, uh, you know, uh, depending on him, right, he will not, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, use, uh, uh, you know, take opportunity to undercut his, uh, his, uh, his position, right? And also, you know, as a subjects, right, when you know that you're being trusted by uh, those people from higher up, you'll probably feel more empowered, right, uh, to uh, do things and try out a few uh, experiments or be creative. Right, when it comes to uh, dealing with certain challenges. Right? Uh, so in that regard, I think uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say optimistic, but you know, there is a line of silver lining, I guess, uh, in uh, this, uh, this uh, sort of lineup. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, that has to be balanced out by, uh, you know, uh, other issues, uh, you know, the lack of constraint, you know, the, the relaxation of constraints on uh, the executive power and, uh, you know, the possibility that, you know, um, you know, the top leader just, you know, dominate everything and uh, not listening to other people, right? Uh, but overall, I think, you know, uh, a lot of things are still sort of very much open-ended, right? This is just a very different way of uh, uh, governing uh, that we have not seen in China for uh, uh, you know, a fair amount of time. And uh, uh, there's a lot of possibilities in, you know, uh, what follows. So that's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> Andy, uh, thank you very much. Um, if I have to use one phrase, a word to describe uh, this whole um, uh, party congress and its, its aftermath is continuation. And uh, in fact, leading up to the uh, the Congress, uh, part 20th party congress, uh, we've seen a lot of those predictions and some a lot of it, you know, really based on wishful thinking. And uh, in fact, it turned out to be not much of a surprise if you had your expectation that not, not much higher, not that uh, um, wishful thinking. Yeah, in fact, one could say that this is a, this party Congress leading up to it is, you know, compared to previous ones, at the least power struggle, horse trading, and jockeying. And indeed, the process, as now we know from you know, uh, from uh, uh, official uh, media in China that the process started a year ago, over a year ago, last spring. And uh, so it's it's the, both in terms of, the, you know, party Congress served basically two purposes. One is the major personnel, the top elite echelon. And the second is the major policy 
eva uh, evaluation of the past, uh, you know, five years, in this case, 10 years, and then uh, looking forward to the next uh, uh, five years or 10 years. So in both of these areas, in personnel and policy areas, I don't find anything uh, that much a surprise. Um, if any, any surprise, I think there's a little bit of that, how much the process has not been affected along the way by a more pressing challenge, that's the COVID uh, endemic or pandemic, how to, you know the exit strategy and policy for that, and how much it, it affected in recent months, both the legitimacy and in fact, in terms of uh, 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 it's, it's you know, in the future personnel performance. So the fact that the seven members, all six, seven members of, uh, you know, all six members of the, uh, or at least six, five, maybe, of the party uh, of the Politburo Standing Committee are so-called uh, um, loyalists of Xi, and not surprisingly, and a couple of them actually did not have, had, had not have a very stellar uh, performance, if you will, because I will talk a little bit about performance uh, legitimacy a little bit later, and uh, both Li Qiang and Tai Chi, uh, you know, led who led the big two big metropolitan areas in China, especially in in, in the case of Li Qiang, who the, you know in the uh, well known now Shanghai were faced with this huge um, uh, problem and backlash of the uh, lockdown, and uh, it, but then uh, Li, uh, Li Qiang has probably already decided that he moved uh, up to the. Um, a standing committee and possibly uh, uh, take over as the premier. So in that sense that the, you know, the process really been long decided so that uh, obviously um, that uh, in terms of personnel, it's not a whole lot of surprise. I, what that all mean, right? Uh, uh, Andy asks us, uh, you know, what the, you know, if there's any unconventional wisdom, uh, I don't offer, I think the uh, conventional wisdom is wisdom after all. And uh, I, in fact, I would actually a little disagree with Junyan's analysis of this uh, Politburo's role being elevated to something like uh, a cabinet. I don't think it will be because it would be, what really, what's interesting about the Politburo 24 members is that it does offer a much uh, a better educated, some of the younger top elite, maybe five years be beyond the next, you know, beyond, beyond the uh, beyond the ne next five years, they may be, uh, you know, some of them may be elevated into that. But in terms of their power, in terms of authority within that as a member of the Politburo, I don't think there somehow there will be any major changes from the previous 10 years. In fact, the continuity in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the party Congress itself is also reflected in the Kind of the uh, the uh, the uh, media reporting, and in fact, you, you report uh, reflected in the party report itself, political report itself. Notice the term used, "new era," right? The new era, Xin Shidai, is being used quite often. Now, I there's a, here's a little surprise. I thought "new era" referred to from now on, the new era of from 2020 on, 2022 onward. No, actually, started 10 years ago. So the new era started 2012 when Xi Jinping first took over. So that here again that emphasized the continuity of the of the 10 years. And uh, now let's look at the policy, major policy, domestic policy. Now, again, without mentioning without much mentioning about the COVID pandemic, which is much more pressing as a policy matter, as a major policy matter in short term. And so the the continuity of major policy, if you read the uh, the uh, Politburo, uh, the political report closely, you really don't find a lot of the actual major changes in in terms of domestic policy um, uh, directions. So this raises a very interesting question, given how the you know top echelon, that's you know governing council of seven members, are all kind of a basically. As, as the conventional wisdom suggests that really there's no dissent, there's no opposition. And uh, so even different opinion may be hard to, to be reflected at the very top. Then the question is what kind of legitimacy what will the, will the party rely on, will the regime rely on, right? And because in the last 30 plus years, you know, since Deng Xiaoping started the reform and, and, and the 
and opening up. Obviously, performance, performance legitimacy plays a huge role in the key, maintaining the regime uh, stability, right? The other two I, I would also mention a little bit are control and, uh, and uh, a strategy, effective strategy, basically separating the central from the local. Those three aspects I see as a key part of, a, uh, of way one, of maintaining uh, regime. Performance legitimacy, uh, control, and, and uh, central local kind of dividing up the central local, you know, at the point of necessary uh, necessity you uh, you know central the center always can sacrifice the local point the fingers at the local as the problem so all this if those remain to be still the case then the question is how do we are they going forward is the performance legitimacy still going to going to be play important part of that that's a question i don't have answer because we have seen in the last 10 years or so in the increase of the legitimacy of ideology, based on ideology, nationalism, and so on. And of course, uh, plus control. Now, as performance becoming more and more challenging, particularly with this more recent uh, COVID pandemic, what kind of, can those leaders, especially at the local level, still rely on performance as part of that? That remains to be seen. So going forward, as I see those three key part of the maintaining the stability of the regime. Legitimacy, that's, you know, that's a questionable, that may be something to, to, to look at. Control, that simply will be increased with all the high tech and the surveillance uh, uh, technology. And the, I think the, uh, the central, the center of Beijing will continue to uh, rely on this uh, separating itself from, uh, from the local. You know, that's an that's effective strategy that's been used for a long time and that's still gonna be used. As recent as the last couple of days, we see if uh, you know Zhengzhou and other places had a problem, and that's still not a national. So as long as they keep, they try to keep that as a local. So they localize all the problems, and that you know really have prevented spillover to uh, to 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 the national at the national level to the whole nation. So as long as that strategy works, which I think will, and I don't think any any uh, challenge would be on the stability. But the question is really on the performance part. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Shang <clears throat> Thank you. First, let me uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Nathan for both uh, initiating and organizing today's event and for placing one long economist in the sea of a very distinguished uh, political scientists. <laughs> I thought I would begin by sharing uh, three, uh, three thoughts. Uh, number one, um, the uh, um, one uh, potential advantage of a highly centralized political system uh, is that if it sets uh, its uh, site in the right direction, it can potentially mobilize resources very quickly and move in that direction uh, very quickly. They might, uh, that feature might have played some role uh, in the previous 40 plus years of rapid growth uh, in China. On the flip side, uh, of the same uh, uh, feature, uh, if the government sets a site in the wrong direction, uh, the feedback uh, process may be very slow and it take, uh, may, might take much longer to do uh, cause uh, uh, correction. Uh, and perhaps the COVID uh, policy is a very good illustration of both sides of this uh, uh, feature. So let me uh, read you some numbers. I was, I'm a number person, so looking at the um, uh, foreign direct investment into China, a very important piece of investment in, uh, of, of, of China's overall investment uh, 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 picture. So in 2020, the, in the first year of um, uh, COVID, uh, foreign investment going to China, mainland China was $149 billion. How big that number uh, uh, was? Uh, in the same year, US, uh, you know, the leading uh, destination for FDI was 151 billion dollars. Essentially, the it was a statistical tie between mainland China uh, and, and the US. FDI in the same year going to Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong uh, was $135 billion. So if you combine Hong Kong and mainland China, it's quite a bit bigger uh, than the US. So that's 2020, the first year of COVID. In 2021, uh, last year, where vaccination has been uh, rolled out uh, 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 and uh, very successful in various uh, uh, countries. Uh, US uh, FDI going to US shot up to $367 billion. 
compared to China's $181 billion, less than half of the US. Uh, and Hong, Hong Kong, sorry, $149 billion, uh, less than half of, of uh, US. If you add uh, FDI into Hong Kong, $135 billion. Some of mainland China and Hong Kong will still be quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, lower than that of US. And presumably, uh, the number for this year has not come out. Presumably, the gap between US uh, and China, mainland China plus Hong Kong will even be bigger. And I thought, I think so. This up and down both illustrates uh, sort of the economic implication of a, of a political system uh, like this. In the first year of uh, of uh, COVID, the gov Chinese government decided to single mindedly pursue zero COVID. As a result, there was time when you know, in many, various other countries, we have periodical or partial uh, 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 lockdown and close downs, uh, working from home and so on. Chinese economy was going back to normal. So much so that in fact, the Chinese COVID policy in 2020 make global supply constraint much smaller problem than otherwise the, uh, the case because China was, um, uh, you know, uh, was uh, close to, uh, uh, you know, back to full capacity in the second half of 2020. So much so that Chinese trade surplus to the rest of the world showed up by a huge amount. Chinese bilateral surplus against US was showed up. Not because there's a change in uh, trade policy from China or any other country, just because Chinese factories were working and factories in many other countries were not uh, working uh, as uh, well. In contrast, now um, uh, most countries uh, believe, uh, you know, vaccinations are good enough uh, immunization, uh, immunization uh, is good enough from combination vaccination or past the uh, 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 infection. In any case, it's very hard to organize uh, lockdown or partial lockdown uh, in the uh, US or, or, or Europe, so we don't do that. But China continued to pursue uh, zero COVID and we have the reversal of economic, uh, uh, economic uh, fortune. So I think that, that the FDI data and COVID policy is a very good illustration of both sides of the uh, of, of, of economic uh, implication with this uh, system to the extent the 20th Party Congress has uh, uh, further centralized uh, 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 power. My colleague Xiaobo says increased trust, but maybe the other flip side of increased uh, trust uh, is that, uh, you know, government will be even more single-mindedly. Uh, everyone uh, around Politburo will uh, will unite around the core uh, party documents official uh, reference to uh, uh, the president. Uh, and you know, it's very hard to do uh, cost correction of anything that, uh, that the president does not want to have. Second uh, thought on the on, uh, appointment of uh, Lin Qiang, uh, who uh, any economic implications. You know, the, the fact that President Xi uh, assumed uh, his uh, third term uh, is not news, at least not uh, much news. The fact that the Li Chang was uh, uh, came out as number two was at least partly a news. I'm sure 50 percent of political scientists will say they had predicted, but not 100 percent. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and there's some element of a of a, of a surprise. So, you know, what does Li Chang mean for the future of Chinese economy? Is next <laughs> year of Chinese economy? It's a probably a one on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, story. On the one hand, in some significant uh, way. Uh, uh, Li Qiang owed his career to uh, President Xi, so, so it's hard not to call him a loyalist. On the other hand, if you look at his background, before the current appointment, he was the number one official of Shanghai, one of the most dynamic uh, financial and commercial center of, of China. And before that, he was governor of Zhejiang, another very dynamic uh, uh, part of Chinese economy, known for very vibrant private sector economies. And as a governor uh, uh, of Zhejiang, he championed for private sector development uh, in, uh, in Zhejiang. As number one official in uh, Shanghai, he helped Tesla and various other uh, um, large um, uh, foreign and domestic firms. Whether it's a good idea or bad idea, it's a separate uh, a statement. But look at, look at his profile and background. It doesn't look, look like he's that different from the previous government, senior government economic officials that you, you would normally label as reformists. So I want to uh, know the, uh, that, therefore, uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, this appointment by itself uh, does not necessarily signal a change uh, in economic uh, uh, direction. That's the second point. The third, uh, last point is about, you know, uh, I want to pick, on, pick up on uh, 
Professor Nathan's point about surprises. There's always something coming out uh, as a surprise going, going down there. So here I want to recall for you uh, the, 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 the wisdom of Wall Street Journal. So Wall Street Journal, everyone know what Wall Street Journal uh, is, was founded in 1889. So in 1989, for its centennial edition, the, the wonderful, wise, and clever people of uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, editorial board decided to publish an article about world economy, in particular try, uh, trying to forecast for its le uh, readers which countries will be future growth stars, which countries will be future growth disasters. So these are investors or business managers, you can adjust your strategy accordingly. In their centennial edition, that's the second half of 1989, Wall Street Journal predicted that Zimbabwe will be a future growth star. Uh, among its uh, list of countries that will be future growth disasters, China was very high on the list. Now, Wall Street Journal may be lucky in getting Zimbabwe right. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> the, the, the thing is, I guess, was, you know, even though we don't really know what surprises, uh, uh, surprises may, uh, uh, may be, it's such a very hard to make forecasts on based on what you think is what's going on in, in the current economy. If had China turned out to be an economic disaster, uh, so China, of course, not only didn't grow uh, just as an average country, it grew substantially faster than uh, uh, not just an average country, but virtually every other large economy or every other mid-sized economy uh, 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 since the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, uh, um, uh, article. So had China turned out to be a growth disaster, many people will came to see, see, I told you, I know exactly what the, why the reason why China was not doing well. We know so many reasons what, for why China would not be doing well, right? So, so that, uh, you know, with that uh, story uh, in mind, I was, you know, often remind myself that perhaps uh, this is the point where conventional wisdom may not be wisdom uh, sometimes, that we want to be a bit uh, uh, cautious about the uh, uh, Project, projecting too much from what we are seeing today, what we are knowing today, uh, into uh, into future. So let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I I, I want to just start by saying uh, when faculty members put together an event like this because it seems like a good idea, um, uh, people have to put in a lot of work. We create a lot of work for people, and I just wanted to thank uh, Julie Kwan and Daniel Sansky. Um, this kind of thought process by professors. We should we should do this. There's something in the news. Uh, this is for the China in the World program, the co-host. I think this will be our biggest event of the, of the semester, um, if you count all the people online. And it takes a lot of work. And thanks a lot to you guys. Um, we have a much smaller event at 4.30. I'm going to advertise it. And it's about this book. Uh, myself and another co-author will present this book about a <laughs> about a about a, a, a U.S. Uh, spy who spent over 20 years in prison in China. Uh, the book includes his memoir. His son is one of the co-authors, and, and I will be there. Uh, the spy has passed away in 2014. So for the 20th Party Congress, um, I wanted to start by saying something about personnel. Uh, I was surprised that I was the one talking about personnel, maybe even more than, uh, than some of my colleagues. But I, I just start with that and say in the foreign policy front, the the fact that Wang Yi is the uh, is the leading foreign policy advisor uh, to President Xi, I would code as good news. Um, having worked with him when I was in the U.S. government, he's highly talented, highly experienced, really smart. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean he has a lot of independent authority to guide foreign policy. Um, that's true for a lot of the officials. But I would say all things being equal, I'd rather have someone highly experienced highly smart, skilled diplomat the than someone who isn't. Hmm? The norm there. Yeah, so yeah, but it's, I wouldn't call, it, it's not him personally devil, it's just a question of does does he have uh, policy authority? And it's the same thing with Li Qiang. Li Qiang would be coded as a reformer if you looked at his career, absolutely as a reformer, a financial reformer, which is really on the far end, like Zhu Ji was a financial reformer, he'd be a re financial reformer, but he's also very loyal. So which is gonna play out, right? In the, and so I don't know how it will work out with Wang Yi. In the military, there's there are two somewhat surprising outcomes or notable outcomes. One is that one of the vice chairmen of, of the one of the vice chairman of the CMC, Zhang Yuxia, is uh, 72 years old. So his um, staying on violates the rule. 
uh, that 68 and out. Um, so he was kept for a reason. And what's the reason? Is it loyalty? Certainly as a, as a prerequisite, loyalty was, was part of it. Uh, some people say, well, he's a combat veteran. There are very few combat veterans who are officers in the Chinese military because uh, fortunately, China has not fought a lot of foreign wars. I think fortunately for everyone. Um, and he fought in the 79 war with Vietnam and the 11-year conflict that followed it. Um, so some people note that. The other somewhat surprising uh, uh, person on the on this Central Military Commission is, is General Ho, Ho Weidong. Um, and, and that is uh, surprising because he took a pretty big jump in status in one, in one Congress. And some people note that that's important because he was the Eastern Theater Commander, which is the, the theater command that's responsible for cross-strait conflicts if there ever is one. So some people say, well, it's Xi Jinping preparing for a cross-strait conflict. Um, my own view on that is uh, you can't really tell with generals on that score. Uh, if Ho Weidong uh, is uh, very experienced uh, at preparing for conflict across the Taiwan Strait, he may also be quite knowledgeable about the challenges that the PLA faces in a conflict across the Taiwan Strait. And he may be more authoritative in telling his boss, you know, this might not work. So it just depends on how it plays out. You can't tell. The idea that, you know, a lot of political scientists have that uh, military people are all hawks uh, is not really correct. Um, a lot of people who have been in combat know how complicated and nasty it is. And a lot of them uh, tend to give relatively moderate advice uh, to their civilian leaders. So we can't really draw conclusions from those facts. In terms of the, 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 the congressional report, it's, it's rather dark. I mean, from an international relations perspective, it's a very dark report. Um, there's a general tone of insecurity, both at home and abroad. Uh, and those two things are linked throughout the report. In other words, external insecurity and domestic insecurity are linked in ways that show a kind of high degree of Leninist concern about security. And that's a very high bar because Leninists are always concerned about security. So even by that high standard, this one goes a little higher. Uh, there are several re references to foreigners trying to destabilize China. Uh, the word security appears 91 times in the document compared to 54 times uh, five years ago and 35 times back in the Hu Jintao era. Um, there's stark language about economic efforts to isolate China and hurt its develop, development, uh, which feeds into some of the domestic policy choices that China is likely to make on tech and other issues in the future. Um, and there's reiterations in specifically to the need for more self-reliance in the tech sphere. There are these slogans in Chinese foreign policy that um, a lot of foreigners watch, and I know a lot of people in Washington watch it. Um, I have my own take on it, and I'll tell you it in a second, but let me say what the slogans are mm. and how they're not disappearance, but they're watering down in the current document, uh, current congressional report seems um, uh, concerning to some. One is peace and development, uh, which goes back to Deng Xiaoping era. Uh, this was always called the keynote of the times, uh, and it is not called the keynote of the times in the, in the contemporary report. Uh, it's uh, peace and development are lumped in with other much more concerning trends. And the other is the period of strategic opportunity. Um, so uh, particularly in the Jiang Zemin era, but I believe it started before him, uh, the argument was that China was in a period of international peace and development, and therefore there was a period of strategic opportunity where China could really focus on building national strength at home in various ways and didn't have to worry about large scale conflict in the near term. So people have latched onto that. In this report, it says the following, you can see what I mean by watering down. Our country has entered a period of development. So there's a development. Our country has entered a period of development in which strategic opportunities, risks and challenges are concurrent and uncertainties and unforeseen factors are rising. So this isn't exactly a statement about all is well in the world. Um, and as I said, there's several mentions of foreign interference in internal affairs to include both Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, the report says the following, quote, foreign interference by external forces and matters related to Taiwan. This was a phrase that was absent in the last party Congress. So there's, again, more focus on these things. But let's look at the two big phrases, the peace and development and uh, strategic opportunity, period of strategic opportunity. My own view of this is that they're like many 
uh, Chinese Communist Party phrases designed to reassure outsiders. And most of those phrases don't reassure outsiders. Um, so when, when China was saying period of strategic opportunity, no one said, oh, everything's fine. They're not, they, they're not, there's no chance of a conflict across the Taiwan Strait or in the South China Sea, East China Sea. Look, they said it's a period of strategic opportunity. No problem. But then when the Chinese Communist Party takes it away, everyone says, oh, my God, they took away period of strategic opportunity. Right? <laughs> And it's the same with, uh, it's the same with um, peace and development. When China was saying peace and development is the key, nobody thought that China was not building its military very strongly and potentially coercing its neighbors. But then when China stopped saying peace and development is the, is the uh, keynote of the times, they say, oh, that means they want war. And there are a lot of examples like this in China. Um, one country, two systems for Taiwan. No one in Taiwan paid any attention to one country, two systems as a valid concept for Taiwan. But if, if China stopped saying it, everyone would say, oh my God, they stopped saying one country, two systems, right? Um, so it, it's, it's, it's either a neutral or a losing proposition, some of these phrases, but it is notable uh, that the phrases have gone away. Taiwan was not at the center of the Congress report and it tends not to be. So people said, well, they didn't talk much about Taiwan. Well, they don't tend to talk about specific policy issues like Taiwan in the, in the Congress reports, and they just issued a white paper in August. So there was really no need to. Um, I don't see all that much new on Taiwan. There's a, in the, in the congressional constitution, there's a statement that uh, Taiwan independence can never be tolerated. If that's breaking news, I don't know what I've been studying my, my, my whole career. I mean, uh, the mainland's been opposed to Taiwan independence very resolutely for a long time. What wasn't said though should be noted, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a push in that in that uh, constitutional report saying we must have unification by X number, you know, by year X, uh, and we must achieve it now. So that should be a source of some relief. Um, but the major concern, and I'll finish with this on Taiwan, is that is that uh, the congressional report continues down this path that was pushed by Xi Jinping pretty hard in the last three years, which is that national rejuvenation is his main mission. And maybe this gets at Xiaobo's argument about the importance of ideology over performance legitimacy. National rejuvenation is the real goal, it's the real ideology. And unification with Taiwan is still linked to that. It's a little abstract how it's linked, which comes first. Is it a prerequisite? Is one a prerequisite for the other? Is the other a prerequisite for the first? But they're linked. And from an outsider's perspective, I take that extremely, uh, I find that extremely concerning because the mainland is so patently unattractive to Taiwan that the only way you're gonna get unification with Taiwan from the mainland's perspective is through coercion and force. The mainland political system, the repression on the mainland, all the other things we talk about uh, are so unattractive to Taiwan that that's really the only option is coercion. So if, if progress must be made on unification, then the likelihood of conflict across the Taiwan Strait and with the United States goes up sharply, and that worries me. And I'll just end there, and thank you, Andy, for putting this together. Thank you to Julie and Daniel for making it happen, and uh, over to my friend Sonny, my classmate and friends. Um, I may just add one phrase that's quite important in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. That's the word doujun. Yeah, struggle. Do, oh yeah, doujun came up a lot. Yeah, so struggle. seventeen times. Seven, yeah, which is well, that's very big, big noticeable because in the past forty years, in the last what ten, yeah. uh, twelve, we really haven't seen that since it's, time of mouth. Yeah, it's real mouth stuff. Doujun is really mouth stuff, and, and that has and, a lot of. Foreign and policy. I think it's a three hundred percent increase or something like that. I can't remember the exact yes. percentage. It was something like a three hundred percent increase over five years ago, and five years ago wasn't exactly the most warm and fuzzy uh, congressional report, right? So. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Do jung. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we, we, all, we all worry about the uh, uh, long Cold War. And so the biggest puzzle in my mind is uh, can we turn the class into rainbows? Uh, something will happen, you know, so, so I hope it's happened. Uh, maybe next month, uh, in about two weeks, uh, President Biden will meet Xi Jinping uh, in at the G20s. I think they can work out something. Uh, so uh, after the 20th Party's Congress, Xi Jinping wrote a letter to the National Committee of uh, U.S.-China Relations. Uh, he said that China is ready to stand by 
to begin to work with the United States uh, to strengthen the uh, cooperation. Uh, actually, last September, when Wang Yi came here on, uh, in a private talk with some of these American friends, uh, he welcomed American companies to go back to China. He says, we'll provide more favorable policies. And um, so uh, I was on these students, you know, he always told us um, back to 20, 30 years ago that you have to read between the lines and read behind lines, you know. So what, what we, can, can we, um, how can we understand uh, Xi Jinping's uh, continue to express his goodwill uh, to American people? And uh, how can we understand the talented uh, diplomat like Wang Yi? Um, this is, a, this is a, some kind of a, false signals or treating American people or trying to, allure, uh, to attract American company to go back to China, or is it real, uh, some kind of a new message? Uh, so that's the puzzle. So I, I think there's uh, two, what I call xin mo, uh, inner demons uh, in both countries. You know, So in China, uh, people always confuse why the United States can now treat us as equal. You know? So uh, China has certain legitimate requests Right and uh, in the state, in the states, uh, we uh, we we realize there's also uh, some kind of a bipartisan uh, consensus, you know, and um, are these two uh, inner demons. How can we deal with it? So I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts. Maybe three. Uh, the first keyword is a great four of the U.S.-China relations. I define the relationship in four dimensions. Uh, for example, the first one is people-to-people -people, uh, contact. Uh, about three years ago in 2019, uh, there about uh, 5 million uh, visitor trips, all right, between our two countries, uh, 5 million. But now you see the big, uh, people do conferences on Zoom, right? And 71%, according to Pew Center, that Americans don't trust China, don't like China. So that is a negative sentiment. Uh, actually, in both countries, in both China and the United States, uh, people have some kind of a... Uh, anti-American, anti-the United States sentiments in China as well increased. So there's a uh, there's a no people no, uh, to people contact uh, the great four in the numbers uh, and and also activity. Second dimension, for example, the uh, dialogue. Uh, uh, dialogue symbolize some kind of cooperation, right? Uh, so before uh, COVID. Uh, actually, before President Trump took over, there's over a hundred channels of dialogues uh, between our two countries. So every every year, the over a hundred, over two hundred American government officials went with China. You know, have a, some kind of extensive strategic economic dialogue, but now none, right? So, uh, so this is a, a really uh, dangerous. Uh, a third dimension is competition, uh, so called. Uh, I think the uh, people, like um, Andy mentioned, uh, the decoupling of high tech area, uh, uh, some sex uh, re put forward the concept, uh, small yards, high fence, xiao yuan gao qiang zhanlue, right? So this is really uh, hurting, um, I think, the relationship because half of these new electronic cars are sold in China, right? And, uh, and China actually produced maybe three times uh, a large number of uh, electronic cars than the United States. So this is, uh, if you start selling chips to China, that really hurt the industry, not only to China, but also to the uh, so-called the concern of the environmental control or climate change, something like that. The last dimension is um, confrontation. So we see more increased conflict, uh, confrontational approach to deal with China, uh, deal with Taiwan issue. Uh, I was in Taipei uh, the night before uh, Ma Yingyu went to Singapore to shake hands with uh, Xi Jinping. So I shake hands with Ma Yingyu. I told him, you know, next, uh, tomorrow you'll shake hands with uh, uh, another mainlander, uh, Xi Jinping. So it's really, nobody can, we can now imagine that only after seven years, you know, people began to talk about uh, Taiwan crisis uh, again, and again. You know, it's becoming a big headache. So that is a more confrontational approach to deal with South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, these kind of new issues. So, so we see the uh, great fall of the uh, U.S.-China relations, but still we're supposed to have a, a new hope. You know, so 
uh, think about the uh, EP3 uh, incident, uh, think about the misbombing of uh, Chinese uh, embassy in, in, in Yugoslavia. So I, I think that seems not that uh, pessimistic. So I still have a hope, you know, so uh, that's first thought. Second, on Taiwan, um, don't forget the, uh, I, 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 I would like to use the word, uh, the key term, institutional constraints uh, to describe how the um, China, how mainland China sees the uh, cross-strait relationship. Uh, no significant policy change uh, on the party's uh, Congress report, but there are two subtle changes. The first one, they put the, the it says put a new statement: China, mainland China, oppose foreign interference. Uh, right, uh, that's what I call the bottom line thinking. You know, foreign experience, interference means the United States shouldn't bother that much. So that's the, the uh, top level design um, is another another uh, uh, sentence is mainland China will strengthen the strategic initiatives uh, for the complete reunification, right? That's high level design, what I can so, so Tom mentioned the August, uh, the white paper published by Taiwan uh, Affairs uh, in last August. But I would suggest you read some of more Xi Jinping's talk, right? At least I can mention his uh, July 1st uh, to celebrate parties, uh, you know, anniversary talk uh, speech. And another is uh, uh, 111. 110th anniversary of Xinhai Geming, Jinian Da Hui Rang Jiang Hua. And also the um, sixth plenary, uh, Xiu Da Liu Zhong Quan Hui Jiang Hua last uh, November. So the, you read all his four uh, talks. Uh, you, you see that he still emphasized the key words in his report integrated development, Rong He Fa Jiang, Liang An Rong He Fa Jiang. And also two sides of the same family, Liang An Yi Jia Qin, and also the uh, concert of the man, Xin Ling Qi He. And uh, I, I, I participate in some of the uh, works, and I think this is uh, not totally, as some of American friends understand the propaganda. No, China emphasized San Zhong Yi Qing, uh, the work to put more emphasis on the San Zhong, uh, means uh, pay more attention to lower medium and lower level of uh, class, um, poor people in Taiwan are to provide more benefit to them. And I don't know doing is uh, middle and southern Taiwan, you know, to try to work on with southern Taiwan, where the DPP space and, uh, and also the uh, middle and small size enterprises from Taiwan. So you provide, give them more benefit. So Yi Qing is trying to let the, uh, trying to, 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 Provide some kind of a institutional attractiveness to to uh, uh, young people in Taiwan. So there's still the tone there. Yeah, still, China I think spend a lot of time efforts on these uh, works. So, but people don't don't buy it. I think uh, the mainland China also have we we'll talk about Taiwan has three dilemmas. Uh, the first one is. Uh, we see the international the internationalization of the cross trade relationship. Foreign government officials continue to visit Taiwan, uh, quasi uh, government to government relationship uh, uh, is, is in there. You know, so um, and also I think the second dilemma for mainland China is we should how we should give some kind of credit to the, uh, what do I, I call democratization process in Taiwan. Because right now in Taiwan, we have a three, they have a three parties, you know, Green Party, DPP uh, enjoyed, uh, according to a number, uh, last May is about 25.6% of supporting rate. And the Blue Party, uh, KMT is about 14. And also White Party, uh, People's Party, you know, uh, led by Ke Wenzhe, they enjoyed 17%. Uh, of supporting rate. So if mainland China, some way mainland China have to work out a way to deal with DPP, to work with People's Party there. So there's no official channel of communication. Uh, so that's the problem. In China, mainland China, we have a lot of forums, but main, basically 
you invite the people from KMT to come. So that is uh, that's not uh, you know uh, enough. So the third dilemma, I think, role model of Hong Kong or even mainland China are uh, uh, failed uh, or not successful. At least I can say right. So this is a how can you plant hope, right, uh, into Taiwan people's mind? So that is the big, big biggest challenge. So after seeing that, uh, I do see shadow, shadows of future uh, in U.S.-China relations, and uh, uh, Andy helped me publish the article in Foreign Affairs. I as I outlined four basic views in China, right, and some kind of debates uh, among our scholars, uh, media people. How how can we uh, work with the United States? Uh, the, from the radical, very radical, the, the people said it's a fight of the century. Uh, China should prepare well. On the other middle, the link, uh, the coupling of the uh, two markets, and uh, and also something some people said is useless. No matter how hard China try, mainland China try, the United States will continue continue to slow down the process. But there is another school of thought. You know, Xi Jinping. I emphasize the cooperation, you know, one southern region, so something like that. So don't forget, as Susan Shirk said, don't lose hope on Chinese Chinese people. You know? So so that's my uh, um, another thought is really uh, interesting. You study uh, Cui Tiankai, the former ambassador's activity. Cui Tiankai, you know, he has a I quote a very interesting. Uh, 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 called, it says, uh, uh, so, so don't fight for, we shouldn't fight a war we are not prepared for, a war we are not sure of winning, a war of anger and attrition, you know, xiao hao zhan. And you see, I follow Qing Gang's activity very closely, you know, you check the uh, website, you know, so he came here, um, last July, uh, and uh, a lot of activity, interviews with different for, uh, American media, uh, right? And uh, also a lot of meetings, uh, governors and uh, mayors, you know, and uh, of course they published articles uh, uh, saying China opposed, why China opposed uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, you know, he, uh, but you study his uh, asking uh, talk, you know, so it's really, I think he's a good soldier, uh, Xi Jinping's good soldier, you know, follow his order. So what he represents, uh, what Xi Jinping really saw, uh, trying to improve the uh, relationship. So so uh, I think time changed people's perceptions. Last year when I was in China, uh, I met a lot of people, people were so confident that China, China defeated the United States in three biggest battles. I send out Zhang Yi, one by me. Well, the first one is <laughs> trade war, right? You see the uh, increase last year, the trade volume, uh, Shang Jing, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, the 750 billion US dollars. So that's why people gain some kind of confidence. Uh, second battle is, uh, is about the uh, uh, battle related sovereignty uh, dispute, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, you know, so uh, some people, Chinese people uh, are confident. A third is COVID uh, policy, dealing with COVID. Uh, but I think time change. Um, today, at least uh, a lot of Chinese people begin to complain about the current COVID policy, right? So, so I think we should should be should have some kind of hope, you know. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Those are great presentations. So although uh, we're not a kind of 100% contradicting the conventional view that I presented at the beginning, which is pretty pessimistic, I, I did get a sense of an alternative structure that one could extract from these presentations that uh, um, you might have a cabinet system where the people work very well, that would be more efficient, that would be good for China. The cabinet consists of younger people with technocratic backgrounds with experience, real economic development experience. China may do well in the economy. 
uh, the government may be more effective and efficient than before. And in that connection, nobody mentioned the anti-corruption campaign, but one could feed that in here that it, uh, and if one views that it's been quite successful in disciplining the bureaucracy that was out of control under Hu Jintao and is now under control uh, that um, uh, Shang Jin said that pr predictions of disaster have often proven wrong. I mean, the West has been predicting disaster for China ever, ever since, I suppose, ever, uh, ever since the 49 or since 89. Um, uh, it's common to do that. Uh, Tom said the military are not necessarily hawks. Sunja says the the, no, the combat veterans aren't necessarily <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, China may may not do something unwise in terms of uh, picking a military battle too soon, and maybe China is so willing to cooperate with the United States. So there's potentially a more optimistic scenario here, which would raise the question of why we, if that's true, why we so much prefer the negative uh, prediction? Is it that we uh, need to uh, talk our, you know, encourage ourselves? Is it because uh, we are, uh, uh, have too little faith in the intelligence of the Chinese people and we think we're so damn smart? Um, Eddie, I, Eddie, let me, let me say something on, on that long, along those lines from my students. And it's not from me. And this is a great thing about teaching. Your students ask questions that make you rethink things. So one student said, shouldn't it be a bunch of loyalists around the president? Because who else is going to take the risk of saying something critical? Like, this isn't working, boss. It's going to be the person who the, who the boss knows is not trying to replace him. Uh -huh. So he may get better advice from people that he fully trusts than he would. That, that's one, one yeah. question that, that was just raised to me. And the second was from a kind of realist perspective, which was Americans should be glad that the gloomy, pessimistic predictions are all right, because that means China won't grow as fast. He'll get bad advice. Uh, he'll have bad economic decisions. And our, our greatest potential rival in the world uh, will, be, um, will be hamstrung. And isn't that better than having a stronger, efficient, well-governed potential rival. And those are the questions they asked. And I didn't you know, have very quick 30 second answers. I mean, I have my own take on those things, uh -huh. but I just throw them, throw them out there for the, for the audience. So let me take a couple yeah. of questions off of the Q&A from the Zoom people, and then I'll come to some of you. And if you would, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question here, line up at the mic is the be uh, quickest way, I think, for us to do that. I'm sorry, it's not too efficient, but we have to have you speak on the mic in order for the Zoom audience to hear what you have to say. Um, so there are some interesting questions in the Q&A. So one I'd like to read is, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I'm wondering if the panelists, and by the way, I think what we should do is just have one panelist answer one question just for the sake of time. So I don't, I'm not going to say who should answer it, but you think about whether you'd like to answer it. Um, could somebody answer this question? What do you think was meant by the concept of Chinese modernization, which is discussed in the CCP's report for the very first time? Are they envisioning a different model of modernization in some way? And another question off of the Q&A, a few people have asked, what's to, what, what is China going to do about Taiwan? I guess that Sunja has more or less given an answer to that. If anybody, uh, and, and I heard your answer to be that, uh, that they were going to uh, continue to try to win Taiwan peacefully through economic ties and talks with political parties. And um, in, I mean, a pervasive view in the West is that Taiwan has already made up its mind irre irreversibly that it doesn't want unification. And so a peaceful resolution is not possible anymore. Um, um, and there's a question about legitimacy from Malaika Robinson in SOAS. Um, and she's asking whether, um, whether, whether we think that the, if if the optimistic scenario is true that this Xi Jinping system is more stable and highly performing, will that enhance legitimacy 
of China and its international prestige. And I would add to that, oh no, I wouldn't add it. There's a person who has asked it here, uh, Alessia Lefebvre from Paris is asking us, um, who, who have been the winners under Xi Jinping in the 10 years? Who are the supporters? And to that, I would add, who are the opposition? So if we slice and dice the Chinese population, who supports Xi Jinping? Who is tired of Xi Jinping? Who's tired of lockdown? Who's tired of thought control? Who's happy about those things? So um, Sunny mentioned uh, this view that you know many people in China believe that China has won the trade war, won the COVID war, won the national integrity war. So that there's a high level of support, but but. It, People's minds are complicated. So, what are they tired of? Xi Jinping, the cult of personality, the the propaganda, the COVID lockdown. Who's? What about legitimacy? In short, uh, among different sectors of the population. So that is three or four different questions, and I would ask each, and they come off of the Q and A. Ask each panelist to pick, or somebody volunteer for the first question and the second question. What was the first question? I don't even <laughs> remember. Modernization. Chinese modernization, maybe Shang Jin, do you want to talk about that? Is there a Chinese model of modernization that's emerging? During the comment about common, uh, common, uh, what policies is she they might be talking about? Okay, that's fine. I can talk about the modernization. Okay, good. Uh, great. Yeah, great. So, uh, Speak uh, into the mic. Yeah. So if you think about uh, you know, uh, the 20th Party Congress, right, and, uh, you know, what are some of the things that have been mentioned? Uh, you know, security is definitely one of them. Uh, you know, we all did the work counts after the, the con congressional report came out, and uh, security is definitely one of the, the uh, things that got all these uh, sort of attention, right? But uh, then another uh, key word that came up uh, often a lot in the, the congressional report is uh, this word modernization, right? And uh, uh, it's usually specifically associated with this thing, you know, where, you know, Chinese modernization or modernization with Chinese styles, right? Uh, so, you know, there's a question of what this means, and uh, uh, what it entails, right? Uh, but you know, my sense of reading these, uh, you know, congressional report is that uh, usually these are not like definitive answers uh, that they will give in, in these reports. It's more like an open-ended essay question, right? So you know, every time when there's a party congress and uh, you know, uh, there's a general sense of something that's important, right? And uh, then you know, uh, the leadership throw out uh, a few words, and uh, then you know, there are there will be like you know, researchers, think tanks, and uh, you know, scholars, you know, working on trying to you know. Uh, enrich or you know, to uh, sort of expand on, on that concept, right? Uh, and a lot of these uh, uh, sort of interpretations uh, will later on be incorporated in the sort of next round of uh, uh, policy documents, right? So, uh, so my sense of that word is that uh, uh, it is something that the leadership, uh, at least you know, some people in the leadership are, are uh, paying increasing uh, attention to, right? Uh, for you know, obvious reasons, right? If you think about who makes policies uh, or you know, who sets the, uh, the direction of ideology and uh, at higher level these days, and those are the people who were very active in the uh, in the 80s, right? uh, had their you know intellectual sort of performative years in the 80s, and the 80s was a period where, you know, China was just opening up, and uh, uh, people read a lot of uh, uh, things about modernization, right? Uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, among others, right? So you know this idea of modernity and modernization was very much sort of uh, uh, deeply sort of imprinted in their in their in their minds, right? Uh, and also you know. Uh, I think this is also sort of the flip side of uh, of the uh, uh, the insecurity, because right? uh, uh, another thing that came up a lot uh, in the, in the report is uh, you see that you know the words like world, globe, uh, international, also came up much more frequently than you know, for instance, what you will see in the uh, 19th Party Congress right, report. Right? Uh, so I think there is a sort of a, 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 so if you think about the Chinese like foreign vision or you know vision of the international order, there are two sides, right? On the one hand, there is this deeply seated insecurity and the sense of you know perception of threat, basically. Uh, but then you know there's also a, a side where you know uh, it tries to uh, uh, make some positive contributions, right, to the world uh, order and to the to the world, right? Not just being a bully or being some uh, 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 being the object of criticism, right? I mean. A lot of people in the leadership and then also in the society genuinely think that uh, you know there are things that uh, uh, you know not just sort of manufacturing good, but you know ideas and uh, uh, values and visions right that uh, you know, this country can uh, sort of put on the table and for others to uh, to learn right. And so a lot of this also went into this idea of Chinese style modernization. 
And so, because uh, uh, if you think about it, this is a very unique experience of modernity. I mean, this is now something that uh, uh, this is very different from you know what has been uh, experienced in the West and also you know among the developing world. And this is one of the uh, first, I mean, you know, very large scale right, uh, sort of uh, improvement in living standards and and human welfare. Right. So you know, a lot of people in China are trying to theorize and summarize right uh, what can be learned from that experience. So that's my take. Thank you, Shaijin. So what policies of the last 10 years might be popular among parts of the uh, society? So there are no real polls in China. So we are talking about guesswork uh, uh, here. But I'm aware if I'm traveling around, you know, both uh, in uh, China and in the US, I realize that, you know, what people my relatively well-to-do friends in Shanghai want and what people I visited in, in Gansu or in, in Guizhou want are not always the same thing, just like, what my Columbia faculty colleagues want and what the people in uh, Appalachia Mountains and, uh, uh, and, and Texas uh, don't always uh, co uh, coincide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so and I think uh, um, in, in, in the, so a few examples come to mind. One, one, one is those uh, Xi Jinping's uh, drive to uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 eliminate the uh, uh, absolute uh, abject poverty. You know, there are a lot of, it's a set of uh, counties that are officially designated as uh, uh, absolute poverty, we can't figure the exact labels based on the local uh, income. There's uh, uh, you know, various uh, levers, government pool to try to uh, help those uh, uh, counties. Often, for example, well-to-do regions are asked to pair with, for every single poor, uh, very poor region, they will be paired with a well-to-do regions. Well-to-do regions will send school teachers, send money, construction uh, uh, companies, and, and, and so on to help those places to, uh, to reduce or eliminate poverty. The way to the poverty gets reduced might not be the most efficient way to do it, might not be the model that World Bank will promote around the world, but very, could very, be, be, uh, very well be popular uh, among uh, uh, segments uh, of society. Similarly, uh, uh, measures uh, uh, tightening the regulation of uh, of uh, high tech companies, you know, digital companies, including the suspension of uh, of uh, and uh, group. It, it, it might create a chill among some business people, but uh, you know, talking to others who don't normally own a lot of stocks, they consider this as it is a you know, China. Um, you know, one of the backgrounds, you know, Chinese inequality is a, is a ma major issue. So when reform and opening started, China was one of the world's most uh, most uh, equal societies. Everyone was equally poor. Over time, the inequality measured by, say, something like Gini coefficient rose very quickly. Mm -hmm. So much so that about 10 years ago, it surpassed the United States. So a communist less country having a level of inequality surpassing the leader of the capitalist uh, uh, camp was quite an uh, achievement. So that was a concerning that's achievement in quotation mark. So in that, uh, in that uh, context, she, uh, she's both rhetoric and policies about common, creating common prosperity, finding a way to reduce inequality. Didn't start with she, started with his predecessor, but that will be, I think it'll be very, uh, may very well be very popular. Anti-corruption uh, campaign, so here we, there's a lot of talk about there is a political tool by the president, but in the country, I think many people thought uh, corruption was a big problem, uh, and therefore uh, some aggressive measure to control corruption uh, was uh, needed. Perhaps not every corrupt official uh, uh, has been uh, put away, but most officials that have been put away uh, are regarded as pretty corrupt. So I think I, I can see that to be potentially very popular as well. I forget what was the other questions that you guys remember. Uh, so, if I can, I just answer. I'm intrigued by the question about the Chinese style modernization okay. question. So I add to uh, what uh, the two previous speakers already talked a little bit about. I'm intrigued by the question because I'm thinking, I'm listening to this, sounds like a very conventional question. It is not. Actually, it is quite relevant. It's a good question, too. I'm thinking back about when Deng Xiaoping started you know, talking about modernization, even go back to the early uh, mid seventies after Mao's death. And at that time, even under Deng and particularly under Jiang and Hu, you think that the, of, from the 
government point of view or CCP's point of view, there's always the saying that the future is something different, right? It's democracy. We will engage in democracy in the future. Time is not yet up. That was the first 30 years. So at that time, there was always the, yeah, well, you, you criticize us, you know, on human rights, on lack of democracy. Yeah, well, we're working toward that. It's just that Chinese conditions were not right. Now that has changed in the last 10 years or so, right? So now the Chinese, I think, find its own way, if you will, right? It's not a model, meaning it cannot be emulated elsewhere, but it's certainly said more confident that we do not need to have, we now know what the future is going to be like. <laughs> this is now. It is a more prosperous, modernized, developed society, well, relatively well society, plus under one party rule. Right party would take care of the people. So the word people coming back a lot now, right? Rather than citizens, right? So it's actually citizen, actually the term disappear all the time. And now almost uh, doesn't exist. It's people. It appeared over 100 times in, in the new, so people being used. Who's the people? Everybody's a people, right? So we take them. And also the term self-confidence appear more than peace, more than fairness, which has appeared self-confidence nine times. So meaning that the Chinese, I think, the, uh, the CCP now regards that they already find the Chinese way of modernization. So to answer your question, to, uh, Andy, about the pessimism, pessimism or, you know, or pessimistic or optimistic, it depends on what your criteria, what expectation is. If you expect that, you know, Chinese regime to collapse, to change or, you know, to, to uh, de democratize, yeah, don't, you know, you'll probably be very pessimistic. Yeah, don't wait for it. Anytime soon. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anybody else on any of these? Or we'll go to the mic. Sir. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this awesome um thing. Um, I have a question. Um uh, Peter Martin wrote a fantastic book about the making of wolf wolf warrior. Um, and his book, his argue argument is that after 1990s, China has been quite hostile towards Western uh, democracy. Um, and in 1971, I, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Nixon who said China is, 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 is a Frankenstein. I think the two, two mentality of West and China has been quite similar up until now. Um, you know, West think that China is still an inferior countries and China is still think the West are intimidating them. In that sense, if, if I were to be a um, theorist, how would you see the, the compromise look like? It, you know, if the both are very hostile to each other, how that look like? Um, and one other question is, I think um, Professor Sun Ji um, argue that America do not treat China equally. Uh, what was that look, what would, would that look like, right? If, uh, how would you argue, um, how would you like America to treat um, China equally? And what does that look like? Um, and my third question is, um, um, I, I was listening uh, recently re listening a podcast and there was an ambassador from U.S. Um, in China and he makes a lot of argument about isol isolationist of, of Chinese behavior. Um, I'd like to hear from a Chinese um, colleague, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because you guys keep saying that China has been uh, quite isolationist um, in terms of having a, 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 a diplomatic uh, com conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sonny, do you want to answer this or maybe maybe some more? Questions? Want to take more questions? More questions. Uh, okay, okay, let's take up. a few, like, yeah. and then then we'll answer a few. Yeah. So that one goes to you. <laughs> now who? <laughs> Okay, so again, I just want to echo, thank you so much for this talk. It was so interesting. Um, I am really curious about the panel's thoughts on Hu Jintao's force removal and also <laughs> and also the <laughs> in addition to that, the um the Keqiang actually like tapped him on the back when he left, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um so and Jun Yen, I, you can answer this one. Get ready. I also I just wanted to what like happened and why. Yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, basically that's my question. <laughs> And I also wanted to kind of use that example to push back on the panel's thought of continuity, because uh, in my personal opinion, the removal of Hu Jintao is not continuity within CCP's um, business as usual. And especially Li Keqiang is also not business as usual because he's at that age where he should be, um, but he's not. So I just wanted to hear what yeah. you guys wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, let's take one, two more. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I'm Yue, the second year student in Columbia SIPA, and I was a journalist from CCTV. And I have a question. So it's really understandable that the market would not have confidence seeing the 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 questionable data sometimes. Let's and have Shang Jin answer this one. Yeah, and seeing uh the Hang Seng index actually drops dramatically. So how long does it take the market to regain the confidence? And uh, I know it's just the uh, expectation. And how do you think the policy will cater to the market? Thanks. Thank you. Muhan? Hi, so my name is Muhan. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is about perception and understanding. So I think it's very interesting to see that you know Roosevelt served four terms as U.S. president, but he is considered one of the greatest presidents in the U.S. history. But she is only trying to serve third term. So uh, far, so far. And talking about world war diplomacy, Until you know, the fifth term, then we'll talk again. <laughs> it might. So for world war diplomacy, I think the Chinese world war diplomacy has been much lambasted, but if we look at the rhetorics or the actions by, U by the U.S. State Department, that is much more aggressive and much more kind of demanding. And talking about, you know, military expansion, uh, you know, uh, talking about ideology. So, um, you know, the Chinese turn towards the left has been very much characterized as a turn towards becoming a Marxist, Marxist Leninist state. But, you know, uh, Biden has framed uh, the U.S.-China competition as being existential for the western bloc so do you think such do you think there's a clear double standard here do you think this is helpful in understanding and managing the u.s china relations we better go and thank you i so, know you have uh, another question but we don't have much time sure so yeah let's get those answers from people starting with maybe jun yen <laughs> what happened what that's a tough question that? tough question uh, yeah so who's uh exit uh I don't know. I mean, I know as much about this as everyone who has a Twitter. I guess let's see. <laughs> uh, but you know, of course, you know, uh, in the in the party congress that uh, you know has gathered so much attention and uh, with so much uh, sort of uh, eyes on it, that you would imagine that uh, an un un unanticipated sort of uh, uh, drama like this will uh, uh, obviously receive a lot of attention. Right? But uh, uh, but sometimes uh, I think uh, at least my personal interpretation is that the simplest narrative is probably the the, the most uh, uh, likely uh, uh, ones, right? And in this case, it will be something like, uh, you know, he uh, who is in advanced age and uh, uh, he seems to have some uh, uh, issues with deteriorating sort of uh, physical and mental capabilities and maybe something came up during that meeting so he had to leave, right? And uh, uh, so that seems to be like the most uh, simplest and most straightforward uh, explanation. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, other people have other uh, thoughts, and uh, there are more sinister and more sort of uh, conspiratory sort of uh, interpretations out there. Uh, uh, but uh, then, you know, if you look at uh, how uh, this event was covered in uh, the official media and, uh, uh, you know, afterwards, right? I mean, whose names still appear? And uh, so far, it doesn't seem to be the case that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of, you know, power struggle or follow up uh, on that. Uh, so, you know, I would actually uh, go for with a more simpler explanation uh, as long as before, you know, any sub substantial evidence, uh, uh, new evidence arises, right? Uh, and you. also, you know, one thing I would add is that if you think about the culture of the uh, the party, right, and, uh, and also, you know, this whole emphasis on, uh, you know, traditional culture, right, uh, that the party tries to incorporate, uh, you know, this is a party that, uh, you know, puts a lot of value on respecting the elderly, right? I mean, in the... Uh, the funny thing is in the party congress, you know, who is actually not the oldest person uh, on there, there was also Song Ping there who was already 105, right? So, uh, you know, uh, part of, you know, holding a conference like this is success of, you know, appearing a success, successful in holding that party congress is you invite all the elderly and, you know, treat them well and they all came here and sort of endorse you, right? So uh, she is very into that, I think. Uh, so, you know, this would definitely not be something that he would like to, uh, this doesn't look like something that is, uh, like he has already planned or, you know, uh, premeditated, if you will, right? Uh, so, you know, just to so put that uh, information out there, mm -hmm. right? Shang Jin on finance. So when Liz Truss and the uh, quasi quantum policy caused British market to tank, uh, you know, how long did it take for the market to recover uh, confidence? About two weeks. Why? Because there's a change of a, a policy. 
the when when uh, you know Hong Kong market opened at the beginning of the last uh, week, uh, the, the decline in market can be interpreted that people worry about continuity. In this case continuity of zero COVID policy, a continuity of other policies that uh, that the investors might uh, consider unfriendly uh, to the market. So what does it take to reverse the, uh, 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 those? You have to have you know real policies to come out from the new leadership team, uh, new leader team, a uh, new leadership team to signal that you know they are serious about continued reforms, uh, and, uh, and and they want to put uh, they, they they put enough uh, priority uh, on uh, economic uh, uh, development. Mm -hmm. I, as economists, uh, try very hard to try to uh, uh, having to read the political documents again in my life. But for today's panel, I actually took some time to to read the revised the party uh, constitution just out of curiosity, mm. and I was uh, I, I I can confirm uh, to you that re the revised constitution also used the language of letting market to play a decisive role in resource allocation. So you know one might speculate that something like that will be will be taken off from the re uh, re revised the party constitution. No, no, it, uh, it has not. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, but that's just these are just words. So uh, uh, that, that that means that you know the the new you know when uh, uh, Li Chang uh, becomes uh, prime minister next March, he has a chance to do something to to signal like market before uh, uh, next March. Of course, the current uh, prime minister uh, is still uh, uh, is still uh, Li Keqiang. At, at least uh, in terms of rhetoric, they also they talk about continued reforms and continue. Uh, uh, op uh, opening, if uh, there are concrete policies uh, uh, coming out that, that show that they, they continue to believe uh, in uh, uh, market-oriented reforms, I think the market confidence uh, will come back. Um, I wanted to address two of the international relations questions. One, one question was, has China gone isolationist? And I would say absolutely not, that uh, if you look at international institutions, particularly in economics, uh, China has been engaged in a lot of new multilateral agreements in the last five years. Um, uh, it's even applied to be part of the uh, the, the, the follow-on to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP. It has applied for that. Uh, it's joined the RCEP, which is a regional cooperative economic partnership. Um, it's involved in a lot of multilateral diplomacy in a lot of places. So I don't think isolationist is the right word. Um, and I would say that if anyone's pulled back from international institutions, it's been the United States since 2017. Um, in terms of perceptions and existential threats, uh, there are these arguments, and Muhan asked this question, um, some American politicians and some American executive branch officials have said that China poses an existential threat China's rise poses an existential threat either to the international system as we know it, the international norms of the system, or to the United States itself at home. Um, I think both of those are, are highly exaggerated, but I don't think they're any more exaggerated than uh, the language in the uh, in the 20th Party Congress re uh, report about how foreigners are going to undermine and destroy China. Um, I really uh, that, that's been a running theme in, in Chinese Communist Party politics for a very long time, but it's gotten much worse under Xi Jinping. And if there's continuity, in terms of continuity, it's really continuity over the last five years, I think, or the last 10 years, not continuity going back to Hu Jintao. There has been some big change under Xi Jinping in the Chinese Communist Party. It's not, but, but there's nothing that happened at the Congress that looks fundamentally different than what we would have expected a few years earlier. I think that's what people were saying in terms of continuity. And uh, yeah, Li Keqiang going, you know, it's it's kind of predictable because he comes through a different system uh, than, 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 than Xi Jinping did. Um, but not all that surprising. And this idea of existential threat, uh, I'll just say as an as a editorial comment, I think one of the biggest problems in US-China relations is that both countries seem to lack confidence. And I, as an American, do not believe the Chinese Communist Party poses a threat to my system if our system is well run and we are confident at home. I don't see how Beijing can determine our political future in the United States um, unless we have some kind of real dysfunction at home. And I don't see how the United States can undercut the system in China unless people in China want to change the system, which is something that maybe Americans would encourage. But the United States is not going to cause a catastrophic 
collapse of the Chinese communist system. And I return to this. We tried that. <laughs> it didn't work so well. Um, we tried to do that. It didn't, it didn't work so well. But the last thing is China's reputation abroad. And I really want to emphasize this. Here we are in the United States. You have a bunch of people here interested in China, some of them from China, some of them just interested in China. And the argument always is there's so much mistrust of China in the United States. Mm. And it's all driven by American domestic politics and Marco Rubio and Joe Biden and all these partisan positions on China that are totally unfair. And how can the Americans do this? It's a bunch of nonsense. If you look at the polls in every advanced economy in the world, China is fantastically unpopular. And if everybody finds you unpopular, maybe there's something wrong. Right? Maybe there's something wrong. And there should be more self-reflection about the things that China can do. Because I don't think, and this is where I'll end, I don't think it's good for the United States for China to be so unpopular in its own region and around the world. It's a force for instability. I don't see U.S.-China relations at its most basic level as a zero-sum game. This is bad for China, and it's also indirectly bad for the United States. But China is unpopular all over the place because of its governance at home and because of its foreign policy. And it's not just an American fetish. So we're going to just have, I'm sorry, we won't have time for you two guys. We're over time, but Sonny has the last answer to the first question. Well, I would rather give my time to Luke. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so of course, I, I agree with the Tom and Andy. I read the article on foreign affairs. I think they are moderate uh, scholars, you know, uh, even they criticize us, uh, China. So I think yeah, to answer the question uh, why there's some kind of a perception or misperception on Chinese people to the United States hadn't treat China as a equal. Uh, to give an example, use Taiwan as an example, uh, a lot of people don't understand why American government invite Taiwanese uh, government officials to, to come here, participate in the summit of uh, democracy, arms sales, and uh, uh, how many uh, number the number of congressmen visit uh, Taipei, you know this kind of uh, this kind of things, and uh, I think the uh, we were talking about uh, around 2015 uh, about the uh, peace uh, treaties uh, between mainland China and Taiwan, but but uh, nobody mentioned that. And now Pek uh, Xiao uh, also and these students or the China, uh, Taiwanese representative here uh, in DC and. Uh, uh, she graduated from Columbia, but she's more, I think, more radical. And uh, so, so it's really um, something to do with how do you understand the concept of democracy? People see it some kind of as a, a skyscraper, uh, very concrete. Or some people see it as uh, as a um, cloud, you know, as uh, uh, in different shapes. Uh, China still emphasizes all process democracy. Uh, still use the term Chen Guo Cheng Min Zhu. Sometimes we political scientists, we don't understand, you know, so what is Chen Guo Cheng, right? As the girls mentioned, you know, so somebody um, will have to go out, uh, you know, from the, uh, the big uh, people's hall. You know, we don't understand, but uh, I'm afraid I cannot continue to comment because I plan to go back to China. Right. <laughs> so, so my point is, there's over the last ten years, there's good and bad and the ugly parts of the policy, right? Uh, I visited Xinjiang uh, five times over the last five years, and Tibet last uh, summer. Uh, in Tibet, I met three Columbia girls graduate from Columbia, and they are trying to understand the growing independence consciousness of Tibetan culture. For example, uh, right now you go to local museum in Tibet, there's usually they put the Chinese Bo uh, Guan, right? Chinese word Bo Guan, and the English uh, words Bo uh, Museum. They're trying to work out, put third line, maybe Tibetan, right? By language. Uh, uh, the, to them, this is a, some kind of a put Tibetan local culture into some kind of a, uh, eco status with English and Mandarin. So that is a really interesting, right? Tibetan language, not Chinese. Tibetan language. Yeah, yeah, Tibetan language. Yes. 
So that is the what I what I uh, want to say. There's an ugly part of the po policy over the last ten years uh, because a lot of you, uh, I see overseas students here, want to go back to China, visit China, but because of the COVID uh, policy, it's very difficult. You know, so so we want something changed. As the uh, before the 18th Party Congress, uh, I think China used to emphasize government used to emphasize class struggle, but uh, but at the 18th Party Congress, the they shift the focus to the one is the high expectation of people's demand for good quality of life and uh, the bad performance, all right, unsatisfied performance of the local government. Uh, as a new focus. This is not propaganda. I think these your some people. Some students are so young, but we remember the Cultural Revolution days, you know, when people emphasize class struggle, at least for now, people begin to worry about rich people depleted of the wealth, you know, the, some people ruin, uh, uh, come out of the country. Uh, but, you know, so, um, but I still have hope on China. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks to the colleagues for great answers.